Hello, Bob. Hey, Ben. It's great to be back in London and in Maui. And it's uh, lovely to think that my voice is reverberating in Maui. And yes. Uh, yes. The whales are here now in the Maui Bay, and they're calving and they're leaping in the bay. And here it's sleeting, nearly snowing. Um, that kind of very fine cold rain that kind of stings you on each drop, you know, as I cycle my kids into town on the big bicycle, I really feel it. Do you have uh, Christmas decorations as early as the United States? They start with Thanksgiving. Does that happen in London? They start immediately after Halloween. Um, Halloween? Wow. Yeah, yeah. So immediately at the end of October. It's the whole of November and December is Christmassy here. That's crazy. That's, that's even worse than the United States. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're at the cutting edge of all that horseshit here. Yes, yes. <laughs> you started a lot, and the Queen was not to be messed with. No. And we were going to talk... Well, the way you outlined it earlier, which I think we should repeat for listeners, is that we've established a revolution through Dumitrescu. We've gone through the sea of a Ricorso and we are on dry land and with, I, with Finnegan's Wake in our hands with Finnegan's Wake in our hands and what I want to do is talk a bit about the senses, about how we perceive the world because just by chance uh, flipping through Finnegan's Wake I came upon the phrase audible, visible, noseable edible and I found this um exciting because when I first um, encountered Finnegan's Wake it was had everything in it no I, I wanted to eat it that, that I had everything but when I first studied Finnegan's Wake everything seemed to be reduced to a de debate between Wyndham Lewis and James Joyce in which Wyndham Lewis supported the eye um, and James Joyce supported the ear and it was time it was space versus time mm. and reading a phrase like that in Finnegan's Wake and then find the beginning of the paragraph it talks about an ear, eye, nose and throat witness which correspond to the eye audible, visible, noseable which is a kind of jokey word because it's spelt as in gnosis noseable, meaning smellable um, one presumes um, but that he's um, twice in that paragraph he's taking eye and ear and then going beyond them to smelling and then to eating so the sensations of swallowing of getting in insi something inside the body so the idea that he's merely locked in a debate about space-time eye ear would not be correct at all exactly it is always about all the senses even the debate between saint patrick and the uh, the Arch Druid is based on theories of time, beginning with Newton and, and some other guys. They work <clears throat> up to the to the uh, early quantum physicist views of, of light. The whole debate about light is not really just about eye ear. Joyce is criticizing the eye ear dialectic all the way through the book by including other senses and their extensions. Now look at the word senses. Senses can refer to our physiological apparatus, but it also can refer to the meanings we get from words and communication, the senses we make of things. Mm, which is a kind of reintegration inside ourselves of the unity of the world as it actually is, that we divide them up or that we have portals, uh, separated portals of touch and um, sight and sound um, come to us through different senses but they're all signals from a single world and the idealist can't um uh, won't credit that they say well all we have is the evidence of our senses so if you start dividing them all up and keep them separate you can finally get skeptical about the existence of a real world at all because you could be always somebody sitting in a chair dreaming and and joy and, and joyce took that point that is the essence of the wake. He's countering all those tendencies to reduce things to a dialectic uh, or a duality. And he, fi he figured out how to make a book do that on an, on an epistemological or meaning mm. level. But also he, he, he included the environments coming from the extension of the senses. That's the genius part. Well, that's the part you always like to harp on, but it's not the part that gives me the greatest buzz. The... 
reintegration of the senses into an imagination of the material world was called by the Romantics the imagination, which Coleridge was going to replace by the word ease and plastic, meaning forming into one. And yeah, there was me, primary imagination and secondary imagination, yeah, right? And, and for me, this um, secondary imagination, this reintegrating the world, is uh, what you unplug when you go to sleep. Or rather, sleep allows you to um, enter a, a world which you are reintegrating yourself so that you're no longer testing it against the real world all the time in the way that you have to when you're awake. But this internal image of the world um, is built up through the various senses, but you arrive within yourself to a unified thing that isn't separated. And you flip the sensory input. Mm. You reverse. The eyeball flips the image coming in. There's also the, that what McClellan called the making part. It's not a, it's not a exact mirror replication, even though within mirroring you do have distortion slightly because it flips, um, whatever you call it, the angle vision, um, right, left. So the, Joyce is showing in Finney's Wake the actual operation of the senses and of the integrating process and showing how media, speech, all the forms of communication of that are part of the sensory making process. And that's a very complex act to demonstrate that. So... You see, I still, I want to spell out this difference with you. I mean, if I think if we go into these tough things where we do differ, I always like it when we agree and we're uniting together in, in the revolution. That's always the, the climax of the show, or should be, and that's great. But I have to air these problems I have. Um, yes, that's good. And, and, and I find the um, enthusiasm for the technical advance always... Um, leaves me puzzled because where it's not hung on a determinate observation when you can demonstrate that a very um, particular misunderstanding has happened because someone hasn't imagined what radio can do yeah, then, remember, I'm not being yeah. enthusiastic about the new senses, I'm just saying they're there and they have to be included in the, in the Marxian dialogue Mm, well, everything has to be. I mean, there, there can't be anything left out. I mean... Um, yes. Okay, you know. so then let's look at Facebook. Is that an extension of sensory life? Is that well, non -sensory you life? Say, well, Facebook? Well, let's think about what Facebook is. I mean, is it an extension of sensory life? Or is it the people spending longer at their desks? Right, that's why you need to get into the the divisions McLuhan said. It's an extension of the central nervous system. You're engaging in the extension of your interior landscape. You're sitting there, you're not being too kinetic. You are using your eye, uh, you are using your ear, but it is such a, it's a, such a hypnotic process that you, you should consider it mm. more proprioceptive or uh, but the reason inner, that it, yeah. synesthetic. But the reason it hypnotizes the ear and the eye is because people imagine or actually are in touch with other people so they're stimulated by sociality they're, if you uh, had a game which I'm sure such games exist where you have a kind of pretend Facebook where um, you don't believe that actually you are in touch with um, these friends and that they're introducing to real friends it's simply a game it wouldn't have millions of followers these sort Just of games because it is there is communication yeah there is communication going on in it so it's, wh wh where where the confusion comes in is how does it relate to previous structures social technological personal that have been established and now are disrupted by this new situation and it's always the the old meanings get changed and people can't change that fast that's where you get into difficulties and uh, misperception of what's going on Hmm. Like, like, and so when you did your your out to lunch thing on Facebook as a vanity table, that is uh, true, but certainly it's puny or weak to limit it to calling it narcissism, because there is a thrill of those who have all these people that they can email to, and it 
the extra thrill is you don't have to respond immediately. You can do it later. So it's like no. you brought up the park bench uh, model. And so you go to the park bench and you can talk even though there's nobody there. And then you leave and someone else can come and sit in the park bench and hear what you said. It's kind of like ESP. Well, it's, it's like scratching a message on the park bench which someone else can read. <laughs> right, and, and you and you and that can be seen Which people by do. thousands of people. Yeah. You see, it's when when McLuhan critiqued uh, Burroughs's um, Naked Lunch and Nova Express, he said that Burroughs was pro junk versus LSD because LSD only inflated images of the dreams that money could buy. It was a consumerist drug, whereas junk heroin allows you to put on the whole universe to wear it. Well, definitely. Facebook, Facebook and MySpace, YouTube, you may not have millions of people watching, but you have that potential. You put on the whole universe. Now, look at the power of that. So it's, that's why people write silly stuff, and that's the content, and that's not the, the appeal of Facebook. It's the fact that I potentially am wearing millions of people. That mm. is the addiction of it. You get the point? Yeah, um, but it depends on your background and training. I mean, if you've... Um spent your time taking very seriously uh, the writing say of William Blake who was not recognized in his lifetime and wrote his own books and published in editions of 10 and illuminated them all himself if you've done that if if you've studied William Blake yourself you can have the imagination when you write a book somewhere that one day people will find this book and millions of people will look at it and it has the potential to change the world and so on so this imagination i think the problem i have with understanding a lot of what you call technological breakthroughs is that i've already been there with previous technologies so i can't find the technology the crunch point or the watershed or the great change in the same way as downloading couldn't impress me because my friend danny had begun swapping cassette tapes of getting hold of rare material of taping gigs himself of sending them through the post to people all over the world who would send back so that he he could he was always opening up packets when he got it at home I said, what are they they're tapes what, what are you doing and he was listening to concerts from his ears were stretched all around the world so using the clunky old technologies he's, he was already exchanging audio data as people would call it when it reaches the computer stage so that one wasn't immediately bowled over uh, I wasn't by downloading because I my point was that if you had the intent or the imagination to do these things before you could have done it with the old technology the technology is not the the crucial um, thing to point to yeah it's the putting on of the audience is um, it, it, when I'm not talking about I don't do Facebook I got I got something on there and somebody yeah but what you do yeah, yeah but, but Bob I, I talk about what it is I'm not it, talking it, about Facebook I'm talking about what you do do which is refer to um, new fashions and technology as amazing breakthroughs which change people's behavior that, whereas I as a cantankerous no, critic clear here of that people who pursue change, and that's not that's not saying good or bad look at the change and what it does to politics what it does to the issues that you're concerned about human communication this, this is what we're talking technically as McClure would say we don't have any uh, personal preference, pro or con, against this. I'm just saying that we're looking for an audience on Resonance and FM, and the, the most of the people in the Western world who are doing Facebook do not, they are wearing the sense of a huge audience. They're mm. not being an audience for anybody, they are creating audiences. At least that's mm. the potential, and but that's that, the appeal of it. Yeah, and, and that's, that's, but that's why I'd go back to facebook as a vanity table in the sense that the appeal of writing self-pitying poetry when you're 14 is imagining well you're miserable now but you can write a poem and one day it'll no, you'll no. be as famous people, as william wordsworth i mean that by the content the typing that's why people why do people type banal things about what they did during the day because it's not the typing that is the appeal it's the fact that i'm in touch with everybody it's your and danny's dream you go up and you knock frank off the stage and you take over the microphone and rant on about zappa's lyrics and what they mean for two hours you have the audience captured and you do it now with Facebook, you capture the world. At least you may not technically, but you can feel it. 
Well, you think so, you are. I mean, but this yeah, is... Yeah, you think it. But it this is the... feel that way because yeah. you are doing it. Yeah, but this is the promise of prayer, of writing poetry, of exhibiting art. You know, I, I don't think this great promise is has been delivered by the technology i think it's a, oh, no, a that's, perennial that's wrecks people's lives within facebook the no, wiped but, out the economy but it's predicated okay, facebook and this kind of technology wiped out the economy no but recently. capitalism has had boon and bust since it started the oh, booms yeah, and busts aren't created by um, something like facebook they're they're endemic to the system. I mean, if you look more deeply at the system, these superficial ways of communicating aren't causing anything. They're reflecting these contradictions in capital itself. And similarly, the vanity... And yes, and the response is that people aren't out in the streets protesting the, the capitalist cycle. They're on there tweeting and typing. You can't get... Marx can't get the audience out there to, to get to the protest. That well, can, the audience disappeared. Well, but just as much um, back in the 19th century, sometimes people demonstrated, sometimes they were reading newspapers, sometimes they were drinking cups of tea or coffee. I mean, the idea that everyone is all doing this or not doing that seems to me the sort of nonsense that advertisers speak when they're trying to get someone to um, ad give them money to, to, to broadcast their stuff, which is where McLuhanism um, rides very close to... Uh, commercial operators who are trying to um, excite people with um, something that's new, something that seems to be reaching a lot of people that you have to be involved with or you'll be left out. And for me, that's all about money and not really about reflecting on what produces crises, what is um, uh, and what the, the, the real um, um, imaginations are that people are in because once you have the idea of a unified civilization once you have um the papacy once you have christendom uh, all leading up to god and then one uh, the vicar of uh of uh, the the guy in charge of the most important um bishopric of rome who was handed the keys by saint peter or Peter was handed the keys by Jesus, and you got all this explanation. You have an idea of a unified system which you could be part of, and you reflect. Well, isn't I don't see the difference with someone um, putting an entry on Facebook and feeling that millions of people can uh, look at it to someone in the Middle Ages giving a prayer and feeling that uh, God is listening to them. I mean, it seems to be the same primitive um, mentality, just using new technology. I don't see why the technology is something that people aren't realising and I must go and shake everybody and say, hey, do you realise everybody's doing this? I mean, the advertisers are already doing that. Yeah, so when you say McLuhanism, that's not McLuhan. McLuhan was not a McLuhanist and you're, you're reducing him. Now, we're talking about the census. The census, what is happening with Facebook? Are they being extended? Now, Joyce shows the eternal sensory matrix going along and having all this semantic overlay, verbal overlay, may be pointing to sociological changes indicating the ten thunders of different media environments so he's showing that the, why write all that stuff he's not just saying hey buddy get back into your uh, into your uh, condom and use it you know he's not just saying that it's more than the reducing it to money and all that that's the point here it's more than the eternal problem mm -hmm. that's the question okay let's say that i don't believe um in my answer to that but I'm saying you've got to look at that if you're going to talk about the present. I mean, there is, you got to get that, Ben. you got to get the relevance of that. Instead of, instead of saying it's all about money, of course it's all about money. But money, what is money today? Money is debt. So it's not, it's not the money. It, what, it, what is it? It's dominance? It's, it's just uh, we all know what's right and wrong, but we argue over who's, uh, who to blame. Who are we going to blame? Who's in charge here? That's the only question. Who's in charge? So who's in charge of our world today? Anybody in charge? Is it a committee? Is it is it the ratings? What's in charge? No, the bankers are in charge. They can pass the buck. A uh, hundred years ago, they couldn't pass the buck. They, it was a slower society. You could say, no, buddy, you did it. You're the banker. There's no banking now. Where's the banking? It's all it's all intertwined. It, it's like a page of Finnegan's Wake. It's all imploded. It's a seamless web with spiraling individualism firing and uh, tweeting out of it tweeting out then collapsing 
it's it's a black hole and a white hole. Mm. Well, this is a depiction of something going on which you're doing, yeah. and it doesn't um, allow me to express my own dissatisfactions or enthusiasms. It's, it seems to me like a, a duplication of what the world is, like someone draws me a picture of it and hands it over to me as if that's explained anything. But until I find a value posited or a um, an opinion, then I can't orient facts that simply um, saying the world is like this as a revelatory thing, uh, what does one do with this revelation? Go and tell people that they're really doing what they already are doing. Is that what we need to be doing? Yeah, we have to point out that that. Opinion. But wouldn't this make them behave any differently? No, no, no. People, people are, are creatures of habit, as Wyndham Lewis said, and creatures of change. So the, the opinionating, the very values that people have that you're looking for in a, in a communication with somebody, actually has no structure now. If you've got four bodies, then which one is opinionating? So I'm asking you to respond to that problem. I'm not saying, uh, I'm not just saying, here's the weather, uh, accept it. I'm saying we've got to figure out how to respond to it if we're going to be, uh, I don't know what you call it, critical, revolutionary, revelatory, uh, advocating people return to their bodies. You know, this is the, uh, what we're up against. This is what the revolution is, is acclimatizing <laughs> this is what the revolution is acclimatizing <laughs> what does that mean what do i mean by that yeah what do you mean by that <laughs> the environment is what we're responding to hot and cold medium virtual physical audible edible noseable what's the fourth one well once you get onto edible you see i think we're in the um the world explored by J.H. Prin, which is of bringing to consciousness the necessary animal survival mechanisms operating all the time we're being civilized beings. So it's that's a, a given. That's given. That's a surrealist anthropological insistence on what we as a human species are, and pointing out that repressing that or not talking about it, um, and believing somehow that. Uh, changing um, your conscious mind is going to alter your life merely reproduces a kind of hypocrisy. I mean, if you read William Burroughs and you like William Burroughs, you decide that actually morals about things are useless because um, you can talk all you like and uh, everyone agrees that this is good and this is bad, but people will go and do this stuff anyway. So what's the point? <laughs> right. There's no repression going on. Or if you're going to talk about some uh, repression, it's a more subtle repression. It's a repression that subtly dupes people who have total freedom to do whatever they want. There's not, there's nothing yeah, but, holding anybody uh, back nowadays. Well, nobody, yeah, but nobody thinks they can do what they want because they all think they haven't got as much money as the next guy. So they all have to go and do things which are competing with each other, which actually mean they have to deny all sorts of um, basic human. Um, things that would satisfy them if they didn't believe that it's only via a private solution that they can reach happiness. I mean, the pursuit of the American dream is the thing that's scarfing up the world. That's true, but what is I mean, the American it's private, dream? Well, it's private it's solutions. Baseball. It's private solutions to um, structural world problems, which are social problems. And it's not realizing that this precious individuality that you have is in fact a social product, that you couldn't be an individual without a society to produce you, that individualism is the flower of society, it's the product of society, not some sort of, um, um, you know, different principle or, or something. Yeah, society um, is a medium, the medium of technologies and communication. That's what's going on. You can... Re you can uh, saying society is like saying uh, snow, but there's 50 kinds of snow or 50 kinds of society. So we break it down and you notice the changes in how people define what they are. Well, so, well yeah, but we've had people denying that snow exists at all. I mean, yeah. you know, we've Some had... Some have never I mean, experienced snow. The, the great... Um, but it's not snow. Uh, attacks. We're talking about the fact yeah. there's different kinds. I mean, we had great 
you know the Reagan Thatcher attacks on um, certainly on my, my, my livelihood as a kind of lefty on your, on your snow. attack on your snow. lefty reader writer. Um, and, you know, she maintained there is no society. People who talk about society are wrong. It doesn't exist because she didn't want any support or anything apart from uh, And she can monetary. get away with that because there was no society in the 19th century or early industrial sense. There was a post-industrial society. She actually was half right. She didn't go all the way and tell you what the new society was, but she was able to say there's, if she said this, I never heard it, but if she did, uh, there's no society. She meant the old medium. And you can have a better critique of what she's saying if you understood that. They just say, what do you mean there's no society? Because actually there is no society in the old terms. There's no community. There's nobody at the park bench. You say it on your show, you know, just a bunch of, uh, I don't know, homeless people or something that that uh, that uh, Gamma failed to organize, right? So people go home to their vanity table and, and they have their society on Facebook. Okay, society is now a new medium. And so you got to deal with that. And it's impossible to deal with anybody to deal with this because nobody's listening. They're too busy expressing themselves. That's that's what the revolution is about then. Oh, defining, really? Defining where we're at and what is an articulate response to that. And then the consequences on whatever you find valuable. Hmm. Well, I think we'll have to uh, rethink the whole project, Bob. Um, <laughs> Good. That's part of it. That's what happens every day. Our society allows us to live amnesiacally, you know, without memory every day because there's so much you got to do. You can't remember. So you're communicating so much you can't remember what you said. Mm. And so amnesia then becomes actually a defense mechanism. So, yes, we are. Every show should be a definition, redefinition of what we're doing, Ben. Yeah. Well, and, I'm, I'm... and that is what we could agree on. And we don't know what we're agreeing on. Mm. Well, where I uh, fall down is that I suppose I just don't find interesting the pointing out the new um, means of communicating that people are using because it doesn't strike me as either here or there. Um, that you know, the, the, the same people. In those terms, it's not there. The same in people the would have used telephones to do exactly the same stuff you know before i don't see um a transformation so these aren't the you're um, ignore, you're an idealist you keep focusing on the same thing and don't notice the new senses people are engaging in they've gone beyond edible noseable blah 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 uh that joyce Leo and that's joyce's point there are new factors to the four senses and yeah but you see this now. is where i completely disagree with your technological um reading not of enthusiasm, but, yeah, reading because not enthusiasm but saying it is there yeah well i mean it, practically everything's there um and it depends what you want to pick on to 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 emphasize but the idea yes, that um we're talking about now and that the key to finnegan's wake is a response to radio seems to me completely not borne out in every sentence I read from it, because when I read um, ear, eye, nose, throat as a progression, for me that's leading to me towards thinking of eating, um, actual food, of, of swallowing, of what's happening inside my body. It's yes, not. But you're eating information. Notice the first word is ear. He's referring to radio, and what, what effect it has on the eye. <laughs> but why? Why should <laughs> ear be referring to radio? I mean, you you see ear and say radio, um, <laughs> but I say tomato. You know, I just don't see why as soon as there's an ear, there's a radio involved. A radio is not involved. Well, you, what you you've got you is a uh, somebody there. who's deeply you imbued. You go to page 382. Uh, well, yeah, if I go to your favourite quote and read it, then it'll no, go I'm your way. I'm but, saying page 382, this scholarly recognition of what the first sentence or so he uh, wrote. No, 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 let me just... Roderick, let me finish what I'm saying. Electric King. That Joyce is someone trained in Thomas Aquinas who thought a lot about the senses, who is developing a technique of realising what you are while you're reading. And it seems to me t to be interested in what's, you know, this idea that we're all unrepressed. He's saying, insofar as we're involved with semiotic systems and social systems designed in hierarchical manners to give us power over this imaginary totality, 
And so far as we're doing that, we are um, uh, unaware of the actuality. And the book is designed to make you aware of the actuality of your body and your your real life, which these um, uh, th these distractions are. Um, uh, preying on and 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 siphoning away, and that he recognizes sexual generation and mortality, which is something people um, who've come from the Christian repression find very hard to face. And most um, education at the moment in the humanities is dominated by a post-structuralist philosophy, which is imbued with Christianity's refusal to face either sex or death. And well, who's following post So Nobody's following that. What are the majority of people doing? They're watching Susan Boyle and all kinds of other things. They're not worried about what academia is saying. It's a puny little enclave. Uh, yes, but I'm talking about uh, what you meet as soon as you reflect on this situation. I mean, uh, we can charge around and try and invent a new rock and roll, but, Bob, <laughs> you know, we're talking. I think we're going to pick up people... Who are beginning to reflect on what um, they're doing and looking at? I don't think we can compete with the um, people running the four-minute mile or climbing Everest or going to the moon. That's not exactly yeah, what we're doing. We're we, talking, and it's we're, it's, and, it brings that in it. We're taking the we're taking the pods that fall off the Jack and the Beanstalk plant that he describes in the story to Uncle Meat. Remember, it ends with the pods falling off. Mm -hmm. Stuff that we are we're a halfway house for the pods that drop off yeah but are we going to just sit around and, and coddle them no no we're no say hey you didn't drop into anybody but i'm today. saying that as soon as you you can um say yeah most people despise academics but if anybody's going to reflect on what they're doing they generally need help and the only place for them to go is knowledge as it is constituted in the universe today i mean there is no other knowledge they can try to go for unofficial knowledge and get involved with um, people who, you know, claim to s this and claim that, the kind of areas which you probably go into more than me. But yeah. they are very quickly going to meet um, the orthodoxies of what is taught in academic institutions. I don't think you can just brush it away by saying, well, most people don't care about that. That's a Philistine thing to say and, and not real. I mean, if, well, if anybody... Most people in information society go to university when they drop out of the working place. They figure out how to get to college. Yeah, in and, North America. and the amount of people going through education is huge. I mean, it began in the 60s. Yeah, yeah. I mean, part of the 60s revolt was working class, young working class people research. having the time to reflect on their condition because they were suddenly students, which they hadn't been before. Um, yes, I understand that. So, 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 I, 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 academia. yeah, but do you, Are you saying that our revolution is guided towards a chain to offer an alternative curriculum in academia? Well, that's where everybody's going to be. You put the boot in where you can. I mean, you, you use the skills you have to aid the revolution. You, you can't provide everything and, and you, you do what you can. And I'd say that the, the contribution we can make is an alternative um, set of ideas to reflect on um, than is being provided um, you know, by the institutions that exist. So that's why I do mention these institutions and not just say, oh, well, nobody cares about them. I mean, in a well, way, you're saying, well, clarity. nobody that's cares. Clarity. You know, nobody that's clarity for me yeah. that this is our audience is um, we're offering an alternative university, an alternative way to reflect. Yeah, well, I'd have thought so because we're not... Um, simply producing a, a pleasant noise. I mean, if we were humming together, seeking to, for our voices to um, penetrate people's consciousness in a beautiful way, or we were you know, jamming with guitars, or, you know, we would be trying to appeal in, in a different way, and it would be a completely different structure. But it seems to me we're talking and thinking, aren't we? Yes, well, so that's I interesting, mean, So the blurb on this show will be Bob and Ben discover that they... <laughs> That the revolution is being conducted in the universities by them. No, no, not at all. I, I think it's been deflected by the, the the universities. What I'm saying is that I think it's being throttled by the ideas in the universities. That that people question yeah, so the this system and then they get fed. Night school. They this get, is what he meant. Night yeah, school. Yeah, yeah. Call his TV Absolutely. show night school. Yeah. 
and uh, yeah, that's what we're offering night school. Yeah, uh, and <laughs> turn it a uh, night school course. And <laughs> I, well, I I think what we oppose and where we unite is oppose the idea of knowledge as a um, corpus which is the same for everyone, which everyone can absorb and simply repeat. Because for us, this is a kind of biblical Bible class cretinism. You know, we all yeah. recite the same stuff, and one of the um, you know, crises I had was presenting Yanku Dumitrescu was realising that probably I was supposed to give everyone a biography of him but then I thought well what's the point of everybody just reciting the same Wikipedia article to each other <laughs> that, that that's not knowledge that is something inert and I think what we're interested in is is dramatising your personal relationship to knowledge and that's just why you talk about sense is making sense you can yeah. make sense of this, but not in a limited sense. And it this is sense. why we like Finnegan's Wake a lot, because it's a book that's impossible to read without making your own sense of it, that you have yes, to navigate you your own path. Look, I'm really struck by uh, night school. Zappa considered his concerts night school, and he used the new, new classroom, the, the rock concert. We're using Residence FM to do our night school. We don't have to go over to the co university quarters and sit Absolutely. The and I, I want complete enthusiasm with new modes of communication um with radio any uh, I, i'm completely um enthusiastic about infiltrating or using any new technology of communication which can allow us to spread how we're thinking and hopefully get more people involved in thoughts which are as pleasurable as they are difficult right so you see youtube MySpace and Facebook don't encourage the night school environment, but Skype does. Yeah, I would say that. I mean, I'm interested in Skype. We haven't. This is a project of mine, which is to actually uh, have you at um, at a meal together with us on Skype, yes. so that you're part of a table of people talking. Well, to Jeff actually Jeff Jeff yeah, Jeff Jeff, former employee of Zappa, has discovered Skype. And, and he's presented me three times in different uh, environments. Yeah, well, I, I presented you on Skype in Paris, didn't I, at the a Frank Zappa conference? That was my first time on Skype in Europe. Right. Um, no, Skype is good for this. Yeah. Um, but the the moment I'm looking for is a moment of shock and revelation. I'm hoping that people will do things to me which have occurred to me a few times in my life and have obsessed me ever since and it's that kind of stuff that I'm looking for yeah like in, in chat forums where people email and spam each other that's not that's fun but yeah Skype is the best new night school Skype is the best new, new, new night school because it allows us to converse but one of the things that we seem to need is the oeuvre of Frank Zappa to talk over and we use Finnegan's Wake and that's um, the result of a lot of um, filtering that we've done and a lot of criticism and a lot of trying other stuff and telling the people around us it doesn't measure up this is not that's as good right. so we've come out of a lot of critical argy-bargy of bursting the balloon of um, in some people's views party pooping because we want the party to be even better and we can't stand the situation where we have to sit on our hands and not criticize the abominable music being played because we're in a work situation or um, somebody might be offended or it's the wife or the boss or all those sorts of reasons so we're part of a um, a kind of revolt, a, a big raspberry being blown at this um, repressed level of existence, which um, we've, you know, we we've, we've banged up against all our lives. Right. So, so those that are repressed, from our view, don't know they're repressed, and it's in, because they're engaged in extensions of their senses. It's a more subtle. They oh. used to call it in the '80s friendly fascism. A more subtle involvement with all the media and distraction and we're sitting here off stage waiting for them to drop in and then they will then acknowledge the repressed but we're not limiting to the the um, Reichian view that okay 
go have a lot of orgasms and you're free. You know, we're not saying that is the uh, solution to repression, right? We're actually saying, well, it's more sex in language and discussion and learning is sexier or is as sexy. Well, That's I mean, more comprehensive. My experience is that sex is impossible without all this, that um, because... I mean, no one's going to lay me who isn't interested, is interested in my ideas. So, um, it's... Say that again. No what? one's going to lay you who's interested in your ideas. No, who's not interested in my ideas. Oh, yeah, I yeah, mean, right, right, right. So, you know, it's it's practical uh, as far as I'm concerned. Um, so Hugh Hefner and pornography missed this point. See, they could have a lot more attractive pornography if they somehow showed... Uh, people like let's have a, a porno story a little fake story so they have a fitting his wake group and then everybody gets all horny from the from reading the wake and they explore it and then they all start screwing each other that would be an interesting porn would it <laughs> well it might <laughs> um, I mean I'm a great you know enthusiast for Ross Mayer obviously and uh, um, I always like uh, nudity and excess wherever I can find them um, but what I suppose um disappoints me is how people think that if something's in color and being printed with a new process it's really sexy whereas if it's you know if you show them fitting as well they say well it's just black and white you know it's just words <laughs> you know that that kind of they think it's sense um uh sensual deprivation to be presented with something like that and they don't seem to understand that that refusal of all these um possible ways of titillating you is actually the sign of something that's doing much more than that yeah so they're a puritan of their sensory life they might be quite libertine with their chemical body but they don't recognize they are puritan and victorian in the limitation of how they engage their imagination and senses all right yeah okay and, and so McLuhan used to write that the book was a visual medium but he said, for me personally, it's tactile. He's saying, you people think the book is visual and you get numbed in the visual space by all its effects. See, that's a perfect example of what you're saying. He did. He personally mm. did not regard books as visual. Well, I suppose the Marxist way of putting it is that our literature is bare-boned and efficient and muscular and powerful because we're acting on its basis. I mean, we're not simply writing for the fun of it. We're living it. And therefore, um, they this want is, to translate what they write into other senses. Yeah, all the time, and that's the test of it. And that anything else would be um, wouldn't be uh, part of the Marxist tradition. That Marx is a Marx is a uh, a critic of philosophy, which um, is contemplative, and everything is um, uh, always being tested by by action. And that has a similar... I mean, the, the the two realms have drifted so far apart in my lifetime that sometimes I think I'm crazy to try and hold them together. But then when I... Um, what are the two realms? Art and, well, literature, say, Finnegan's Wake and uh, Marxist politics. Right, um, that's good, and, that's and good it's, dialectic. And it's only um, realising that, uh, um, that the betrayal of Marxism in the Soviet Union begins really with attacking modernism and James Joyce um, the, realizing that James Joyce is in, insisting on something that the betrayal of the revolution in Russia left out that Finnegan's Way actually becomes the key to understanding what went wrong with Marxism yeah it's like if we actually became more popular more more heard and on some major network all we'd be doing is advertising our night school Mm. You know, come over here, you know, yeah. and engage. So, like, we are continuing what the greats were doing 100 years ago, and we're still carrying on the Marxist Manipian Zappa tradition, and we don't care if masses not hear it. We're here for those that drop off. Mm. Well, we're the other people. We found a way yeah. to get to you. Yeah, well, I mean, you can't start with uh, masses of people. I mean, the masses of people are the end result of. Um, huge um, Error. uh, big errors. well big errors but big activities you know that, that the millions of Elton John fans are the result of terrific amounts of work on the part of his manager and the advertisers and him and everybody else they're a result so you can't begin with a result you, you have but to begin where you can 
that's your daily beef. Finney's Wake and the Socialist Party. You you do dab into potential change on the mass level, but you retreat to Finney's Wake, and then you make it useful to the Socialist guys, but they don't really believe you, so you remain marginalized. So you are always juggling between affecting the masses and knowing it's not going to happen the way you want it. Exactly. Something like that's going on, which is it probably, you could say, that's the way it's always been in society. It's always been that way. Hmm. But you notice that the um, the Marxists that I like uh, uh, tend to be sensitive to this other realm and that that actually improves their Marxism because it's a sympathy with what the body or the unthinking part of you has to experience because of the necessities of um, social... Um, of social living within the society you're in so um we're all and this is where i agree with you about we're all locked into this um thing you can't escape it i'm not interested in some kind of um arts and crafts existence outside the facebook problem you know that that, that we're we're right in it and there's yeah. no getting round it this is what we need to reflect on yeah i think i think that is mcclone's main point i mean uh, and maybe Joyce's. Uh, one of the main points is, hey, this environment's way bigger than what people were used to in 1910 or 1850. You know what I mean? That's, that's, a, that's a useful reduction. We're in this, and we need to figure out how to talk through it or to have a language for those that fall off it. Or yeah. think they fell off it. See, you can't even fall yeah. out of it. Yes, you can't. You only think you do. And often the people who seem most to have fallen off it are the people who've understood it best and you need a discussion between the two yeah and that's what you liked about zappa and i mark he could be right in the middle of the mass market yet talking from the margins but still be right in the middle that's mm. what uh, you admire yeah the continual awareness that some arcane avant-garde artist or musician who the person interviewing him has never heard of is in fact giving him his angle on the moon glows yeah and and so his interviews always were night schoolish he was always teaching yeah i mean we you, you mentioned how we've gone through a lot of sifted a lot of things and events well that's what was symbolized by zappa's 179 names on freakout all the things he processed and sifted through yeah with the um, refusing that um, trying to show that these things are determinate influences which lead there and, and, and lead to something and getting rid of the kind of um, glamorous biographical I mean he called it biographical trivia didn't he when he, he yeah. and he made up a, a kind of um, a sort of story about himself that wasn't really I mean, his whole thing was about getting divorced. He didn't mention that there was gale and uh, stability or anything like that. And so he sort of made a myth up. Um, That's right. Now, now, let me go. I just was thinking about, I don't think anybody up to that point had listed so many influences. I remember first looking at that album and saying, wow, look at all these people he's listing. It seemed like, how could not somebody be influenced with so many people? He was actually showing the McLuhan-esque environment. The, the overwhelming cultural mm. buzz that was around him. And Don't you remember being shocked at seeing so many names listed as influences? Uh, it wasn't really the um, the amount so much as the uh, the jumps being made. I mean, the you know, variety. Well, the no, cross, but yeah, being able to putting Bram Stoker right next to Eric Dolphy, just yeah, you know, See, and, and that that is real Finneganese. He got, he hadn't studied Finnegan's Wake. He only knew Joyce, but he picked up on what. The present was a boat. He was saying the same thing as McLuhan oh. and Joyce and, and as is, found in Cantos. But this is part of actually respecting your own brain, because your own brain is uh, responding to this and that in close proximity. But most areas where you're allowed to reflect on this won't allow you to admit that these two things are proximate in your brain, which is another reason why the poetry of J.H. Prynne carries the same revolutionary argument because it insists that we do go from um evo sticks sticky tape to hegel you know without without pause that's the way our minds are working 
and um, these are and true. That's a modern condition to have access to so many media. See, that's the uh, that's the ground we live in. That's the jungle we live in. They, you could, uh, you know, like Dickens or Alexander Pope. They couldn't have such a variety of stuff that you could say for their day they were encyclopedic. But man, we're really encyclopedic now. <laughs> mm. We have so much we process. Yeah, curiously though, the um, the more primitive stage gave people the uh, a kind of illusion of the encyclopedia because they took nature to be an encyclopedia of God, and in fact this idea led towards naturalism and collecting fossils and in the end working out evolution and geology and and so on so yeah, there was the book of scripture and the book of nature mm, and and thinking of nature as a book to be read um did have a lot of um something very good in it because now um nature is simply a sort of hurt woman to be protected by a knight in shining armor called the eco movement Embodying yeah, all kinds. Everybody is taking. I see it on the beach here in Hawaii every day. Everybody's down there taking their pictures and videotapes, constantly recording nature. <laughs> yeah, and uh, it's interesting. And on the cell phone, you know. Uh, okay, I don't know what you imagine a beach person is like. I mean, you have the images from the fifth sixties on the beach. Everybody is looking at their cell phone while roasting in the sun, and reading and checking their their email. It's incredible. No, you could say they're not relaxing. They're not enjoying the the sense of nature and the wind and water on the beach. But no, they do that too. But they come back out of the water and then look mm. at their cell phones. They're engaging new senses. You don't have an encampment of surfers who are partying all night and uh, really living the life and looking weather beaten and driving around battered no, that's, jeeps. No, that's on, that's on another island, Hawaii. <laughs> Right, so Hawaii, where yeah. I, I'm in the wealthiest part, where yeah. the luxury hotels are, and so I'm seeing that level of society, mm. the consumerist mm. level. Well, they need to uh, make sure they phone their accountant to, so he'll reassure them that he's moved their money into somewhere good, so they feel good for the day. Yeah, uh, a lot of so arms on. merchants, weapons yeah. dealers, they're moving uh, contraband around the planet, right there on the beach beside me. Yeah, yeah, a lot of them are. Uh, overweight uh, fat uh, you know like businessmen ugly guys yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the only guys with money today now bob we've got about three minutes left and uh, i'd like to reflect on how our conversation went we don't normally do it but uh, it's interesting for me because i i had a kind of crisis about uh, what you say and felt very disagreeable physically you know and i had to kind of spit it out we work towards something better but I feel that um, this is number 32 that number 33 is gonna gonna be even better I think we're, we're, we're improving and I'm looking forward to the next one and I've got a minute to respond mm -hmm. yeah well the you have a violent you have a violent something in you you react to words you know intensely I mean we're going along and you you feel like real angry i don't know what that I, I don't feel any emotions uh of like that when we're talking i do enjoy the intellectual stimulation or the uh, aesthetic impact on the brain of, of of patterns and i get eureka's doing this but i i never get upset by what you're saying i do get upset that you you're not labeling what i'm doing accurately but i would never get as intense as you seem to be imparting right now yeah, well, I'm an emotional casualty, but you just look at the England I'm living in. You know, it's uh, it's amazing <laughs> that I can I can talk at all. <laughs> yeah, it's incredible. So it's, yeah, it's like uh, I'm the warden of the prison up there in the nice, wonderful penthouse suite. And you're down there in the fourth level of hell in prison, <laughs> and you're asking me to send some coffee down to you or something, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, two, please. Okay, I can understand that. Right. Yeah, I am. I mean, you wouldn't you wouldn't believe what I'm looking at as we talk. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, utopia is, is a minor glimpse of where I'm at. Yeah, well, I can see uh, security lights on our backyard. It used to be nice and dark, but now it's lit up, so it's like a concentration camp. And we have to cl <laughs> close the blinds in order to sleep. Okay, so the yeah. medium is the difference. I'm in yeah. a different medium environment than you are, and that's yeah. what's being communicated. That's what's being argued here. Yeah. The two media. But I do you, have here on the computer, stuck in a piece of blue tack, an actual feather 
from a scarlet ibis which I managed to pull out from the um, the netting round their cage in London Zoo so I look at that and it makes me think of um, animals yeah but isn't it interesting that you know you're physically your chemical body is in the ghetto and I'm here in utopia but we're sharing a new space Skype you see that's that is something to notice that must affect language certainly and we'll probably talk more about this on the next show our time's up thanks very much bob in maui thank you ben in london <laughs>